VHF and up is actually where I think most of the innovation, most of the new things in amateur radio are being done. Um, it is different. There are people doing different things. There are people trying new things, whether it's technical or propagation, satellites or moon bounces uh, you will hear this afternoon. So one of those that I see as particularly important and actually has grown over the last two to three years is amateur television and amateur television coming down in frequency and adding new and wonderful things. So without further ado, um, Noel Matthews to talk about advances in amateur TV. Thank you, John, and uh, good morning. And uh, those of you who were here last year, this is a bit of a continuation, uh, talking about what we're doing with uh, reduced bandwidth television. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what we're doing on some of the other bands as well, at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, talk about what we believe is next. As John said, this amateur television is really going through a, a revolution in, in what we're doing and how we're driving things forward. And also, there's a couple of uh, projects which uh, have us got us looking up, and I'll just cover those briefly, as uh, they're also covered in other streams. So, um, a quick overview of what amateur television is in the UK is we're active on a lot of the bands that you guys may remember ATV being on, particularly when we talk to people, they talk about being on 77s AM in the 80s. Um, we are still very active, or we are active again on 70 centimetres because of digital. Um, we had to migrate away from it uh, because of the spectrum width that an AM signal occupies. We took up the whole of 70 cents in one go. But back in the 80s, guess what? It didn't matter because nobody else was there. Now, it does matter. So um, what we've done is we've adopted digital on 70 cents. And nominally, that's a 2 megahertz wide signal based on 437 in the band plan. Uh, but also, we've been experimenting on some of the reduced bandwidth uh, technology which I'll be talking about. 23 centimeters is probably the other best known band for ATV, and we're still active there. That's where the majority of our repeater outputs are, and where a lot of the activity takes place. 13 centimeters, uh, we've suffered a bit of a crisis there. And as you're, you're aware, you all had your license updated last year to say that uh, we lost 40 megahertz out of 13 centimeters but there is still room for television i have to say at the moment though it's not a band that we're focusing on 3.4 gigahertz is one of the new bands and is proving to be really excellent we've got some repeaters licensed there running two megahertz by digital signals and they really do work very well very very well in fact uh, the top picture there is a guy up in the northeast who lived 20 kilometers from his local repeater. He found that he could put a, a straight LMB with a homemade uh, horn using a Marks and Spencer spot covered in tin foil, and he can get the repeater on 3.4 gigahertz. He would get an extra 3 dB if he used the weight tree. Uh, 5.6 gigs. Um, there is actually one repeater that's now got a license for an input on 5.6 gigahertz. 10 gigahertz, of course, we've always been in 10 gigahertz. It's a very simple band to get on to, particularly for analog. But uh, there is now some activity on digital using the reduced bandwidth technologies I'll talk about. And M0 DTS and G1 LPS up in the northeast are experimenting and have been uh, playing on 24 gigahertz FM um, and, uh, and have had quite a lot of success. But the big bands that I, I'm going to be talking about are the ones at the front, which is 71 megahertz and 146 megahertz, which are the new spectrum that's been allocated to us uh, a couple of years ago. So October 2014, two years ago actually, um, amateurs have had access to 146 to 147, but it was also on the basis that Ofcom only wanted to see new things happening. They didn't want more FM channels. Uh, and 25 watt 
Oh. Did you just make life challenging? Uh, the RSUB in their infinite wisdom allocated the middle 500 kilohertz for digital modes, including reduced bandwidth television. Uh, so that's where we are, 146.5. Uh, but because we've now gone down to less than a megahertz, we've had to do some new things. Normal digital technology uh, won't work there, and so we've had to reinvent what we're doing. On all of the other bands that I've been talking about, we use normal DVB-S, which is the satellite technology. We can use set-top boxes that you can buy in Maclean or on eBay, and we can use relatively simple, easy to get hold of transmit equipment, you conforming to the standard DVDS standard, which is what you use for um, uh, FreeSat and Sky. It's very similar technology. But because we're now having to go below one megahertz, we had to do something very different. So you'll hear me talk about RBTV, which stands for Reduced Bandwidth Television. And as I said, it is normal fast scan digital television, but below one megahertz wide or one mega symbol wide. Um, in the UK, we kind of, because we have no good reason, we've adopted uh, 333 pillar symbols. That's the data rate. And when that's running with an FEC or a forward error correction, about 7 over 8, it ends up at about half a megahertz wide. And so it fits nicely into that allocation that we've been uh, given at 146. And it gives us in the order of 350 to 450 kilobits of video. And it is based on the satellite standard. We haven't changed anything. We've just reduced the size or we've reduced the bit rate, which is fine, but you can no longer go into Maxlin or go onto eBay and buy a free-to-air satellite receiver to receive it. Uh, similarly, because we are running at such low bit rates, using the MPEG-2 standard, which is the standard that um, uh, Freeview and, and everybody else uses for the standard definition transmissions, MPEG-2 looks um, pretty cracked at half a, mega, uh, half a megabit. And so we also took the opportunity to switch to MPEG-4 code, which is, which is available. It's not that difficult, but it was just something else we had to do to, uh, to get to, to build a new tank. So you'll hear me talk about RBTV, and that's reduced bandwidth television. And it is purely DVBS that's shrunk down in that. So then we had to... Uh, as a community, we went, okay, so we've agreed on this. How are we going to do it? Um, I'll talk a little bit more about RBTV in a moment, uh, in about Raspberry Pi in a moment. There are the great thing that going to MPEG-4 meant is that in the Raspberry Pi, there is a native hardware MPEG-4 encoder. So one of the solutions I'll talk about is using the Raspberry Pi running some software written by F5 OEO, which gives them their very nice compact system. Uh, the, more, the, the, the other approach, the more flexible approach, there is a hardware solution, which is an FPTA solution developed by G4 GUO, or DATV Express, and that's uh, basically an FPGA SDR type card, which runs between 65 two and a half gig, and will give us 100 kilohertz up to 12 mega symbols, uh, uh, symbol rate. And so it's very nicely, it covers all of the bands we want to use. <coughs> On the previous slide, I forgot to mention that we've also, uh, you, we are, have now got an allocation of 71 megahertz through the work of John with Ofcom we've got that additional bandwidth of 71 megahertz. That's not quite so easy to get onto. With 146 megahertz, you 
purely go online, sign up for an NOV, and it comes instantly back. For 71 megahertz, you have to apply for a special permit for free. So special research permit, but it is available, and you'll see in a moment four of our guys have applied for it. But the great thing is that DATV Express, this board will cover that frequency allocation. So it goes from 71 megahertz right up to the uh, two and a half gigahertz band, which, as you'll see shortly, is going to become important to us as well. Um, that card is going out of production because. The, uh, the team has realized that that software will port very easily onto a card called the Lime SDR, which is a, a card which has been developed by Lime Microsystems. Uh, very, very complex card, very, very capable card, uh, and will be available not as a specialist amateur product, this is, but as a general SDR card. And so the DATV Express uh, team are phasing this out and putting, they're going to be porting their solution onto Linux. So I talked about uh, Raspberry Pi. Well, here's Raspberry Pi in a box. Um, the standard, even a Model B, has got the MPEG-4 encoder. And with the Pi camera, you can generate uh, DVBS signals out of it. There are then a number of ways to get that uh, INQ signal onto air. One card we did uh, was called the DigiThin card, and that is the modulator card, which actually sits inside this diecast box. And with a local oscillator, the SI570, out of there, you get 146 megahertz. Actually, get four, three, seven, uh, four, three, nine megs as well because there's no filtering on the basic card. So, for a demo unit, that will generate MPEG-4 reduced bandwidth television. And actually, with filtering and power amplifiers, which I will talk about in a minute, John, um, I've worked uh, 100 kilometers based on that. That's my prime mover, and you'll see a Raspberry Pi in action uh, shortly. But it really is that simple to get on it. So, encoder, modulator, filter, 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 and power amplifier. Oh, filters. Half a megahertz in digital is pretty tough. Um, many, I don't know how many of you have got a spectrum analyzer in the shack. But uh, you start running digital mode, you really need to have access, and I don't mean just television, I mean digital mode generally. You really need to have access to a spectrum analyzer. And you also need to be careful about filtering. And so, particularly on 146 megahertz, where we're fitting into that tight band of a half megahertz, we've got two meters just here, we've got all sorts of other services outside of the, the allocation. We really have found that filters are becoming more and more a requirement. And it's not just on 146 meg. I, uh, although I wrote this slide and I know how true it is, I went to Ports Downhill last week for Portsmouth and had exceeding difficulty receiving on 70 centimeters. And that was because I hadn't got adequate filtering in the front end of the preamp. Very, very noisy RF environment these days. As we get squeezed on spectrum, it means that other stuff is happening beside us. And it's, more, it's becoming more and more important that we do good filtering and also the requirements for filtering on receive as well. Uh, the UK microwave reflector has had a, a chain running just recently about the need for filtering on 23 centimeters because people are having problems with DAB and digital TV. You can't see it. It's not like the old days. You can't work out why you're not perceiving it, but because the noise floor is just coming up and up. So, absolutely crucial. And for us, the other challenge has been our amplifiers. Um, a thing called spectral regrowth is an issue when you're running digital signals. Now, 
John needn't get worried. This is not what we're doing on 140. But this is a typical uh, DVBS spectrum on a satellite. But the professional uplink only really run to about minus 30 between the peak of the modulation where the shoulders start to creep in. Um, requires very, very linear PA. Uh, a technology called pre-correction would be a great help. But because as amateurs we haven't got that, we end up having to back off. Yeah. And what that means is to achieve a spectrum which looks like that, that is a 70 watt PA running at 5 watts. Now, in my own particular case, I run one of the Mitsubishi modules on 146 meg. And I give it 5 amps at 12 volts to get 7 watts out. But you can achieve it, and you can achieve good shoulders, and it does it does work. You do need uh, good heat sinks and fans, and you also need big batteries for your output. So it is a challenge. That is the way to solve it at the moment. As I say, pre-correction would be the, the way forward, and that's what the professionals do. But given our systems and the, how we run the system, it's going to be quite difficult. But I think with the Lime SDR type technologies coming along, that is becoming more of a thing. But at the moment, if you start to look at running digital, and you want to run clean digital, and I don't just mean TV, I mean data as well, you really need to be very conscious of what's happening on your, on your digital. So, reduced bandwidth television, set-top boxes are great, free-to-air set-top box will receive your local repeater, it will receive any of the normal amateur TV signals, but as soon as you drop down below one mega symbol, one mega five, the boxes don't work, and that's because they're not designed to work, the DVBS commercial specifications only go down to one and a half mega symbols. So why should they work below one mega symbol? Some, some of the more ex, um, niche satellite boxes claim to work below one mega symbol, but it's unlikely they will because the chipsets are really the determining factor. They're not designed. So we were faced as a, as a community, as the ATV community, we were faced with how are we going to get around this one? And the solution was really to design one. So some guys got together, they took a commercial tuner, they found that there were some commercial tuners which had a chipset which would go below one mega symbol if treated correctly. And they developed a card which we sell as a kit from the BATC shop, the tuner module, the USB interface and a bit of power supply, not complicated. Together. And the guy Jean Pierre, F6DZP, developed what's known as the Tune software. He thought of the hardest word to spell in English and named it with that. My, my spell checker has now had that word added to it. <laughs> and it is, it's an optimized uh, receive solution for digital television. And it will re receive anywhere between. 1.5 kilosymbols and 45 megasymbols. So to test it, you can hook it up to your free view, not your free sat dish, and you can receive free sat or any of the other satellites. And not only that, it's not just a receiving tool, it's also a diagnostic tool. And we learned several more lessons from using the tune and it orders that we need to get the S meter because when you're dealing in digital signal technology it's actually the quality of the signal not the level of signal that counts. And these are some screenshots that Jean Pierre took actually using his software. And at the very top, first of all you'll notice one of the most important things this software gives us a view of the constellation, the digital constellation. So this is 
QPSK or quadrature phase shift E, and you can see each of the symbols in a corner of the constellation. And when you've got a nice clean signal, uh, nice clean uh, constellation, that's great because it means you're probably going to get a good error rate or MER. And this is the magic number, the modulation error rate. So at the top, everything's fine. We've got an RF level of 36 dB. That's quite good. Uh, we've got a, a signal to noise or an MER of 18 dB, and the constellation looks good. But hang on a minute. The second one, we've still got the same RF signal level, but now he's actually using a test set to get the noise on the channel. And you'll notice that the constellation isn't as clean. And the error or the modulation error rate has dropped significantly. More so, more so, so that down here, although we've still got the RF level of 36 dBm, the transport stream or the uh, digital signal is no longer usable. And so it's not just about signal level. And this is exactly the effect I was seeing at Port Down Hill a week and a half ago. Um, I was getting, I was getting, yes, getting good RF levels, but the digital performance of the system overall was not great. And one of the things we found on 1.6 meg is multi-path also can cause this. So where we've got a, a not as much a uh, line of sight path, we can get this type of effect. Uh, this is just a, another example of how the digital signal may not be as clean as it should be. And in fact, this constellation, you will see, is very clean. This was one I took. It's actually on, uh, on, on, the, on the test bench. So very good signal level, very clean constellation. But there's something wrong with the uh, transmitter because actually the constellation is not in squares. And this was a uh, transmit system where the modulator chip was not balanced correctly at the frequency I was using it at. And so even though we've got a high signal level, very clean, noise-free dots in the constellation, the error rate is down to 7.5 dB. Uh, and to give you an idea, a good signal is 15 to 30. So even though that was a bench test, it was actually uh, not a good uh, So we've talked about, about transmitting. How do we receive um, reduced bandwidth TV? Well, the great thing is that actually majority, the, the good thing about two meters was when we got given that allocation was that the majority of us had some form of old ERG that we used to talk back. We could build a preamp fairly easily. So, the RF side of it was relatively simple. We had to learn a bit about the use of filter filters. And of course, 146 megs is not within the fan path or the, uh, the, the frequency range of a, of a satellite tuner. So even when we built our own USB module, it was L band for 950 to 2150. We have to do an up conversion from 146 megs up to L band. And the way we do it is we, we found that there are some available units uh, designed for the US satellite TV market which we can use. And as long as you've got enough amplification and enough filtering, you can get a pretty good thing. So it goes into the USB tuner and into the PC where we get the details. So does it work? Well, I come back to this, John. He's the man. <laughs> 25 watts is tough. 25 watts ERP. So it's out of the aerial, so we can't cheat by putting up big yardage. Um, to give you a comparison, 25 watts ERP in a 500 kilohertz bandwidth, which is what we're doing, half mega, versus one kilowatt ERP, but nobody runs one. Oh, yes, you do. If you've got a 100 watt rig and a 10 dB aerial, in theory, you can easily get to one kilowatt on two dB. In, in a two and a half kilohertz bandwidth record, 40 dB difference. 
So we kind of make life hard for ourselves in TV, but that's why it's a good technical jump. And I'm not just saying this, I mean, there's one or two ATVs in the room I can see, I think they would bounce. But generally, plus or minus measurement accuracy, we are sticking to the 25 watt PRP on, on TV. Primarily because it's too difficult to have to build a 150 watt or a 300 watt PA to get too much more out. Um, portable operation is needed. The, uh, the successful stuff really has been done uh, out portable. And of course, 146 megs is into G only. You can't work the French or the, uh, the Dutch or even the Irish. Um, when the NOV came out, originally there was a restriction, uh, a geographic restriction on the edges, but that's now the First QSO. <coughs> On me was two months. Uh, the NOV came out in October after G4CPE and G0WFT made the first QSO on the last day of the year, 2014. And the current record is 183 kilometres, which was me up on Brown Clee, Staffordshire down to Bell Hill in uh, Bell Hill. So, uh, that was quite a fun day, see Mike walk in the room. Uh, so I was on Brown Clee, here's just some examples of uh, how we do. Uh, here's the path, it's not a, a true line of sight path for Mike. Uh, 130 kilometres, and you will notice that really was touch and go. I mean, we decoded pictures with a constellation like, like that. And that's, that's not it really was pretty much on the gate. So, uh, and you'll notice that the error, the error rate is creeping in. There, is, there are the Kirby errors in there. That, I think another DB down, we would have lost it. In fact, it was, it was pretty much on the gate. Uh, two guys went out to Wind Green, which is near Shaftesbury in Dorset, up to 168 kilometers. They held the UK, uh, the X record for about 15 minutes. I worked them first and I worked somebody else uh, further. That path, even though further, was almost line of sight. Uh, Martin was quite a reasonable signal, but an error rate of uh, 10 with no, uh, no errors. Checking his watch, because how we do it, because, because we're transmitting on two meters, which is where we also do talk back, it becomes difficult to do talk back and transmit. So we, we do the five minute transmit. So he's actually checking his watch to see if it's time to, uh, time to uh, uh, go to the seat. <coughs> also on the same site um, was GABPG, uh, same path, same distance, but uh, he, he, he was running a similar system, perhaps a little bit more ERP. At one point, conditions really came up, and you'll see he was almost, uh, what you, I guess you'd call it fully quiet in, uh, in FM terms, but he was a very good team. And then Dave, the HGKQ, who was down at Bell Hill on the reverse side, on, on the same hill as the, um, as the Beacon, but it's got a very good, a, a nice county council car park with an excellent takeoff to the north. And uh, there again, structured path, 2% um, error correction, constellation getting pretty, uh, pretty marginal, but uh, we made 183 kilometers. Now, uh, what, what you need to understand is we belong to the British Amateur Television Transmitting Club. So the, uh, the next clip I'm gonna show you, which is a video clip of what we received over 183 megs on 183 kilometers and 146 megs shows uh, the camera work leaves a little bit to each side. There isn't any audio. And some of the station techniques isn't quite good. It worked. 
he, look, he smiled then, he knows. <laughs> so that's uh, about, that's a Raspberry Pi. That's the other thing I ought to stress. That is a Raspberry Pi camera and a Raspberry Pi into a different modulator system. But, and that's the site. Um, this, that's a Raspberry Pi on uh, doing 183 kilometers on one and there's his five element yard. So that's what 146 makes it like. So the other bands, that's that's 146. The other band, um, 70 cents is actually easier because we there's no ERP limit. Uh, we can get more antenna gain quite easily. It is a noisier environment. This is a screenshot from Rob m 0 dts who lives up in, uh, near Middlesbrough, which of course is on the edge of the North Yorkshire Moors, and there's a, a primary user on 70 centimetres on the North Yorkshire Moors. And Rob's got this theory that he could use RBTV to actually fit inside the primary user uh, activity. But we have done uh, quite a lot on 70 cents as well. Um, f 9 zg and of course, the Continentals are allowed to use it as well, so we can work the X on, uh, on, uh, on 70 cent. Uh, f 9 zg regularly tests over 200 kilometers, and I have actually worked him from down near Hastings, that was 239 kilometers. Uh, and the other thing we found, that actually we've been talking about three, three, three kilo symbols, but there's no reason why we can't drop down to 250 or even down to 125. The, um, the moving pictures get a bit rough at 125. Um, but, uh, never mind the quality, did you get the contest number? Uh, the other thing we started doing is uh, using 10 gigahertz. Um, we sort of had one of those light bulb moments and realized that we're all set up to do 437 meg, transmit and receive. And of course, some of us use Seventy centimeters as the IF for our ten gig transverter. So it was actually a very simple matter to get on to uh, ten gig. And Dave GHGKQ and I have done ninety-three kilometers on the juice bandwidth uh, on ten gigahertz. The uh, interest in seventy mega, seventy-one megahertz is growing. Uh, four stations have applied to the special permit, and I think you'll see some activity there shortly. Um, it's harder because a lot of us haven't really got four meter equipment, aerials, and everything at the start from scratch. Whereas 146, I think a lot of us had that uh, at the start. Um, and what we've done to try and encourage the activity and get people on air, because we do like technology and we do like playing and it's hard to get people actually to get on air. We've been organising get on the air days or activity weekends, not contests because people run from contests as well. So activity days, we've organised one uh, through the winter period of one every three months but uh, during the summer we had one every, uh, one every uh, uh, month and typically people have been going out portable. So, uh, is, uh, that was the guy that Wind Green that you saw from. Uh, that's, um, that's Lowell, just above Lowell Ranges. And that's Rob on the North Wilkesmore. And we encourage activity, not just digital activity, but analog activity. And I ought to say here and now, we still do do analog. 23 centimeters FM is still crucially important. It's a very uh, low threshold for newcomers to come into the hobby. Very easy. All of the repeaters have still got analog FM. Got on so what next? Um, DVBS2 is next. Um, what is DVBS2? Uh, it's a capable of carrying more bits per hertz. So more uh, video. Uh, bandwidth within the same RF bandwidth. And uh, the big attraction in the early days from broadcasters was it enabled them to do an HD channel in the same bandwidth as they were doing standard definition of satellite. 
But the, uh, the thing why it's of interest to us is that it operates close to the Shannon limit. And also, quick mention, will be the preferred modulation scheme on the new satellite that's going up. And so what I mean by this is this is CVDS here. So for, and that's QPSK, and that's some of the higher order modulation. So we're operating down here, GVDS, QPSK. So for a given bit rate, you need a given level of signal. This line here is DVDS2. So GPSK can buy us a couple of dB by switching to DVDS2. Some of the higher order modulations up here are the modulations that they run on satellites. So your sky transmission, I think, is called HPSK. Uh, HPSK was used in the early days and is used for a lot of the broadcast backfall and news gathering. Uh, the guys who developed the DV, uh, DATV Express card, Charles before GUO, has done an early implementation of S2. F60ZB has done an implementation of an early implementation of S2 on the received software. And so literally last week we went out and did the very first transmission to DVD S2 on amateur band. And I think we've proven that it does work. This is myself and Dave up at Portstown Hill. And we were working Charles over at uh, Worldy, the developer in charge. And it does look as if we can get anything up to 3 dB. Plus or minus error, correct, you know, the error measurement. We think it's probably going to be in the order of 2 dB by going to the DVDS2. Uh, side DVDS2 runs a thing called pilots, which is supposed to help the receiver lock early. We didn't see any difference during these tests, and we wonder if there might be a mobile application. If the receiver knows something about the transmitter, it may be able to work with mobile, we're not sure. Charles and I had the first DVDS2 HPSK here, so. And also, we did transmit, or Charles transmitted, and we received, so that's HPSK, that's 32, that's 16 HPSK, and that's 32 HPSK, five minutes. Um, uh, so, you know, we're taking it forward. We're not standing still for DVDS. You know, there's more to be had. And the reason why it's interesting is because stay tuned to hear more from this in two sessions time from Graham. But there is a geostationary satellite going up, which will be available for amateur television. And DVDS2 is the preferred modulation scheme. And finally, the other reason why ATV is looking up is we've all had fun receiving MTP from the ISS. It should have been easy, but it wasn't because it's not DVD compliant. The ISS doesn't stand still. It was an unknown link budget. Graham never tested it before he put it up there. And, and we tracked it from a Land Rover. So stream three, 1645, come and hear more about that. But this just gives you an idea that really, you know, this is the new golden age for ATV. There's so much going on. There's new developments going on. There's chances to really do stuff on air. Um, it meshes well with what's going on with you know, SDR and the emergence of internet video radio technologies. You know, state of the art stuff is what we're doing here, but we're not hindered by the types of constraints that professionals have. So, and the other thing is, you get to see everybody else's projects over the air. And, and the message is, do some real radio today. Get involved in amateur television. Thank you. Right. And um, la last month's ragtime. There you go. Yeah. Am I on the air? Yep, yeah, yep. there. I'm there. Okay, just a couple of comments from me with VHF managers that time. Um, Ofcom have been going through extreme agonies in their licensing department. And the, the issuance of NOVs has been hard. <coughs> We're hoping very soon to have news of uh, renewal of 146, which is a 
role in the company allocation. I'm working hard on the 71 next side um, to get the NOVs through, but it seems to be changing sounds when it seems to be responsible for different things we can work with. On the power issue, the battle I'm going to face and try first is for spectral power density on 71 megahertz. The reason for the 25 watt CRP is that these are non-amateur allocations according to ITU, and in other countries they're used by whether it's PMR, versus radio, military, or whatever. Ofcom have international agreements. The international agreements based on 25 megahertz, based on 25 watts output in, in a uh, ERP in the 12 and a half kilohertz channel space. Tw I'm sorry, 25 channel space. Yeah. It's an old agreement, it's a set of HCM agreements. So on these non-traditional amateur spaces, there are international agreements. But I started work and had detailed discussions and a hopefully high-level agreement work towards spectral power density for amateur TV MOVs. So that's something to look forward in the But as we're running out of time, we've probably got room for one or two questions for Mel if uh, somebody would like to put their hand up. Hi, I'm Al, Dave, go to OCT. Um, the distances that you're pointing out on uh, 77s, uh, the French channel, so yep. it's going to be set to uh, yep. is, is that point to point now to drop that, or is that some trop over? Is it trop over? Uh, that was point to point from uh, Fairlight near Hastings. It was an appalling day. Throwing it down the rain, he was out for them and I was. It was actually during the IIRU June contest. So it was, it was true, it was true hard work, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't tropo enhanced. Unfortunately, we just haven't somehow managed to catch any of the tropo to see what really could be done. Okay. Right, well, I'm going to call time. Thank you very much, Noel. I think reduced bandwidth to television is actually one of the things that's helped me as VHF manager convince Ofcom that amateur radio is a really good thing. So, please come back uh, It's quarter to 11 for Peter Bacon from 3ZSS to talk about six metres. And again, can I ask you to thank Noel in the traditional manner for a wonderful talk. <laughs>